Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kendra Gaither. I serve as the head of our Coalition for the Rule of Law and Global Markets here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And today, during this panel, which is a conversation about removing barriers to investment and focusing in on governance and reform, we're really going to dive into a, a number of the themes that you all have been hearing and themes that have been discussed throughout the morning. Um, and so I'm really honored that we're going to be joined with leaders from business and government who are going to help us to examine those issues. Because as you, as you know and as you've heard, um, really public-private partnerships and the collaboration of both public and private investment and support are going to be really critical factors uh, in the economic recovery and the rebuilding of Ukraine. As part of our work in the coalition, one of the things that we've identified is how critical the rule of law is as a foundation for economic recovery, economic rebuilding, and really setting the, the tempo or the tenor for how companies can be partners uh, in recovery stories and how they can work hand in hand but that really involves creating the conditions that invite in um, that strong support. So today we're going to hear from uh, four luminaries uh, that I'm here joined with on the stage. We're honored to have the Deputy Minister of Economy, uh, Mr. Taras Kachka, uh, the Deputy Administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development, Dr. Isabel Coleman, uh, the Director for Centib the Center for Accountable Investment at the Center for International Private Enterprise, Eric Hans, and the president of our MCHAM Ukraine, Andy Hunder. Let me start, if I might, with you, um, Dr. Coleman, uh, since we just had the honor of hearing from the administrator um, in uh, giving us uh, some thoughts about those next steps. Um, would you share with us, um, given this conversation around the public-private partnerships and what uh, each uh, entity can bring to the table, what are two or three critical steps that can be taken to improve the Ukrainian investment uh, climate for U.S. companies? Thank you. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. I, I just want to start by emphasizing a theme that you've heard from several other speakers, including Administrator Power, which is it's really remarkable what the Ukrainians have done in, a, in, in war uh, with their economy. You know, Mustafa Naim was talking about um, how it's fully functioning, the government is fully functioning, um, the financial system, um, uh, courts, every, everything is fully functioning. Um, I had the opportunity to spend several days in Ukraine in February, and it, it really is remarkable. Um, and certain sectors have been growing, even though they've lost 20% uh, of their population are now refugees in Europe, many uh, millions are displaced. Their economy um, has lost about a third, but sectors have been growing. And it's just a, a remarkable uh, testament to the determination, ingenuity, will of the Ukrainian people and resiliency of the economy. Think what they can do in peace. Now, the World Bank has estimated that reconstruction needs are going to top, right now, currently, more than 400 billion. And just to put that in perspective, that's about twice the size of Ukraine's pre-war economy. So how are they going to get there? How is this going to happen? They have to be able to attract um, uh, private sector investment to do a lot of this. And you, we all know that uh, Ukraine is on a path to EU membership. And thinking about what that looks like going forward, the opportunity there, because Ukraine, when it joins the EU, will be you know, somewhere between the fourth and fifth largest economy, uh, uh, population, uh, country size in, in the EU, um, which is a big market and enormous uh, potential. You know, e when you look at uh, its economy compared to Poland, Poland's economy is three times the size of Ukraine's pre-war economy um, with, with uh, fewer people. So, just to give a sense of a comparison, but what can it do to attract that investment? Um, listen, it, it needs um, very, we've talked about it, strong rule of law, um, strong uh, competition policies um, to make sure that there's transparency and an environment that really is that strong enabling environment. Um, I think Ad Administrator Power mentioned Advantage Ukraine that USAID has been supporting uh, as a way of helping to um, focus some of that 
um, uh, incoming, but also the demand to prioritize uh, the, the um, uh, first priority needs for, for reconstruction. Uh, USAID has been providing some technical capacity, helping them get more people um, uh, at advantage Ukraine with investment banking skills, legal skills, everything to look at the deal flow. Um, the, but of course, the second thing is sticking with a very robust anti-corruption agenda. I mean, just as recently as 2020, a survey indicated that one of the top concerns for investment decisions, decision makers in Ukraine is, um, is corruption. And so it is a real issue. Um, we all know that. Uh, I think the country has made great strides in that front um, and has um, gone um, not only in made investments in anti-corruption entities, um, the high anti-corruption court, for example, but also in e-government, uh, allowing um, a lot of the transactions and processes to be done electronically, which really can eliminate corruption. Um, uh, Prozora, which is the e-procurement system, again, something USAID has invested in since 2015, that uh, really brings um, a, a public-private partnership inside Ukraine to more transparent procurement, um, both doing it electronically uh, so that it can be seen every step of the way, but also um, bringing civil society to bear. We've worked with Transparency International Ukraine uh, on the setup of both Prozora and Dozora, which is, um, has a thousand volunteers that are flagging um, uh, high profile, high risk uh, public procurements. And so it's this type of partnership, I think, that can give investors uh, confidence that the strides that have been made on the anti-corruption agenda uh, will continue, and I would just close by saying that this is truly an inflection point for the Ukrainian economy as it um, hopefully transitions soon from a wartime economy to a peace economy and focuses on that ascension process to the EU to really um, continue with decentralization, transparency, um, and, and limiting the role of um, outsized uh, persons and individuals in particular sectors. I think of it as the de-oligarchization of the economy and not to lose this moment uh, to push forward on that agenda. So I think uh, those are a couple of things. Um, having a strong investment promotion uh, mindset um, and bringing to bear the resources and the uh, both at a, at a national level, the prioritization, but allowing it still to be directed at a, at a more regional and local level, not losing that decentralization, and then sticking very, very tough with a, the anti-corruption agenda. Thank you. Thank you, that's a, a perfect breakdown of from the 30,000 foot to the very tangible things that are both being done by USAID and then the opportunities um, that that partnership is creating for the business community. Um, might I turn to you now, Deputy Minister. Um, uh, Dr. Coleman talked about uh, some of the anti-corruption initiatives, and that's something that the Prime Minister talked quite a bit about this morning in his uh, address and the efforts that the government was undertaking. Would you share with us and maybe elaborate on some of those initiatives um, that the Prime Minister mentioned that, that you all are working on to uh, remove barriers to investment and create that confidence uh, for partners? Yeah, of course, but I, I would like to start with like with uh, the E words that were quite often mentioned in, in previous panels, this the European integration and energy and how the reforms and helps to improve uh, investment uh, at attractiveness of Ukraine so that, uh, that the first day of, of war in energy was the first day of our autonomous work of electricity detached from Russian and Belarusian system. And by the mid-March of 2022, so then when we were close to remove Russian forces from Kiev key, uh, suburbs, we actually legally attached our electricity system to the EU-1. That helped us to live through the winter, but at the same time, what is important, that last year, electricity was one of the top export products for Ukraine to the EU, because in summertime, we export a lot up to uh, up to 40, 50 million US dollars cost electricity uh, from uh, monthly from, from uh, Ukraine to, to the EU. And now, uh, last week, we resumed the export to, of electricity to the EU it, from Ukraine. And it means that Ukraine is a, now currently an attractive place for 
uh, place in generation of, of electricity, uh, electricity generation in Ukraine. And we, uh, as well, months ago, in Mykolaiv, in the uh, very close to front line. So one of Ukrainian companies started the operation of wind power generation uh, capacities that will export the electricity to, to the European Union. So this is the exact example how during the war we are integrating into the EU markets and how it increased the investment and effectiveness of Ukraine. But it is based on the years of very boring and long and almost invisible process of reforms both technical and legal and also transparency and in the liberalization of markets, establishment independent regulator, regulator commission, et cetera, et cetera. And it was in like in this, this discussion like this was like, like very slow movement, like, 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 like we are losing time. But these are the processes that requires times so that the same situation is for example, with uh, judicial reform. So with judicial reform, we have a lot of complaints. But if recently, in the last month, this year, we already have at least a dozen of uh, criminal convictions of corrupted judges. So that it also took several years to investigate the small corrupted, big corrupted cases in judicial community. But now we have the final criminal convictions of those corrupted judges. At the same time, we have about half of judicial positions in Ukraine are vacant now. And what, what, what happened like during like last seven years, the big debate about pro-judicial reform community and the conservative, let's say, judicial community vested interest, they fight on the mechanism of selection of judges. And now what is, what is very pleased for me, because one, one, of, one of my closest friends, uh, uh, Roman Maselko, which is the most radical fighter against judicial corruption, is a part of this council that will be responsible for selection of judges. So it means that we are slowly winning in this battle for, for in, in, judicial, uh, in judicial corruption, which is extremely conservative. It takes years and years for every state, so including the United States, to, to, to modernize the judicial system. And we are advancing, advancing uh, in, the, in this. And of course, that you know, I'm not a professional anti-corruption uh, specialist, so that's, uh, that requires like a lot of knowledge of different processes. I'm rather responsible for boring trade, trade agreements, but uh, what is interesting that I came here from, from Toronto where, where we uh, announced the completion of negotiations on modernized Canadian-Ukrainian FTA agreement. And it is like copy-paste of, uh, of US, USMCA agreement which is based on very profound trust to the re domestic regulation because it's related to services, to good regulatory practices, etc. And uh, for me, this is a good signal that Canada actually checked, verified the quality of our domestic regulations. And it, in reality, it's not so bad as percepted. Yes, yeah? so that it is really good for good, good uh, business business environment. And it means that. Uh, we have really good opportunities based on the results of previous reforms. We are not slowing the pace of these reforms. It's, it's otherwise we are, we are like speeding up with a lot of, a lot of processes and it provides like fruits, fruits in, in, into the new economic opportunities for all of you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And I would say um, that often it's those boring things like creating the frameworks of the FTA, the, in, the invisible work as you noted, of creating the reforms. It's those bedrock decisions that are, are really what uh, pay dividends. So thank you for, for highlighting um, those efforts. Um, Andy, if I might turn to you. Um, obviously, MCHAM has been extremely active in supporting members who continue to operate and cope um, with the impact of the war. But at the same time, you have a very clear vision for, for what's needed beyond the present circumstances. Um, and what conditions in particular for business, um, American business, um, will help them to be part of uh, supporting Ukraine's future. Um, I heard the Deputy Minister talk about judicial reforms. I know that's a, a priority for you, but would you share for our, for our audience today some of those reform efforts that the business community has identified um, as really priorities uh, to support the nation's efforts to rebuild? Yeah. Well, so th thanks, Kendra. I think the very first barrier that investors encounter when they even start thinking about investing in Ukraine is the perception. The perception of Ukraine as an investment destination. Um, I've been working and living in Ukraine since 1996, the last 27 years. 
And, and I've seen, I've seen the good, I've seen the bad, and I've seen the ugly. So if we start with, with the latter, I started my career on television, and what ended up with the TV channels in Ukraine, they were all taken up by the oligarchs. Mo mo many of them lost making, but the oligarchs controlled them to control the hearts and minds of the electorate. Then I spent seven years at the largest mobile operator, which is now Vodafone. It's good to see colleagues from Vodafone here today. Uh, and at the time, it was uh, majority state-owned, together with the Germans, the uh, Dutch, and the Danes. And then one day, the decision is made that this is being sold off to the Russians. So the Russians come and buy, buy and they were. They were buying up the jewels in the crown. And um, Russia and the Kremlin, they have wanted a corrupt Ukraine. It's the way they've done business. And they, they want the, 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 uh, to see a corrupt Ukraine to, to continue. Um, I think then I um, spent time in the pharmaceutical sector. And again, it was seeing the ministers of health becoming millionaires uh, very, very quickly. Um, so there is reason why this perception is there. But I think what we need to do now, and when I say we, it's really the companies that are already working in Ukraine together, together with the, the US Chamber and together with this initiative of um, the, the business initiative, it's really to get the messages out about what, 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 what's going on. And you know, let me share just some, some, some stories. The largest uh, bottling plant, the largest Coca-Cola bottling plant on the European continent, uh, in terms of production volume, is just 25 miles uh, out of Kyiv. Um, and it actually, in February last year, it fell under occupation. The Russians came in. It's near, near Brovare. Uh, it was under occupation. Then it was liberated. And Coke now have re refurbished it, and they're back, fully operational. Not only is the plant operational, but they've also re they're rebuilding a, a kindergarten in the community, really supporting the community. Um, I saw Roberto here from PepsiCo, so I have to mention also PepsiCo. Um, PepsiCo have three plants in, in, in Ukraine. Two very large ones in Mykolaiv, doing the soft drinks, uh, the juices, also now the Lay's potato chips, and a plant in, um, in uh, near Kiev, Vishneve, uh, doing children's food. Um, when you go home, or tomorrow morning when you're having your cup of coffee, the Nespresso coffee machine, when you've had a cup of coffee, have a look upside down, turn upside down, have a look where it's made. It's made in the plant, a US company, big US company, Jabil, made in, in Ushhorod. Eight trucks leaving the plant every day. The, the, the actual, the factory is one mile from the border of, of the EU, and it continues to, to, to produce. We have here the ABCDs, ADM, Bungay, Cargill, Dreyfus, the large agricultural exporters that are continuing, have been in Ukraine for many years, and are continuing this, 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 this grain corridor. Um, we see investments being made as we speak. Unilever have just announced a brand new $20 million uh, investment in a brand new factory outside Kiev. Nestle already have three plants in Lviv, Kharkiv, which is reopened, and uh, in Torchin, near uh, Lutsk, which they're investing another 40 million uh, euros. Um, I see here Lena Kosharny from Horizon Capital, uh, chair of the Amcham board, uh, managing assets under management, I think it's about 1.2 million, a billion, a bit with a B, and uh, Lena has managed to fundraise $125 million during the last year following the, the full-scale invasion. So I think, you know, we, we see these companies, talking to companies like, you know, Citi, Visa, um, the banking system, it, it is up and running. And I think it's really changing that narrative and the message is we really need to, to change that, that, that perception because there is, there is still a lot we do um, and we are kept busy. We are the largest Amcham in Europe. We have a full-time staff of uh, 40 people, um, nearly 33 of them are back in Kiev now. So we're uh, supporting the members, the companies, many of you uh, that are there. You know, we spoke with Uber today. They've just uh, expanded up to 18 cities uh, across Ukraine. So I think it's really this narrative uh, and it's very important for the companies that are there to be the ambassadors. And our message is to the companies that aren't in Ukraine today. It's invest, you, first, the Ukraine is open for business. Come to Ukraine, invest in Ukraine, and start investing now. I think don't leave it too late. Don't miss the bus, because the reconstruction uh, has already started. We are seeing many of these plants that are being reconstructed. And don't miss this opportunity. Come to Ukraine and come now.
Thank you. I'm sure the members very much appreciated the, the, the way that you highlighted the incredible work that they are continuing to advance. Um, let me turn now to uh, Eric Hans, uh, Director for the Center for Accountable Investment at SIPE. Um, maybe you could share with us, Eric, from your perspective, um, since we've heard from you know, uh, the various leaders here on the, on the stage, can you share with us uh, maybe some of the policies that Ukraine might adopt to attract high quality investment with uh, positive externalities um, for corporate culture, um, uh, specifically um, uh, looking at that as a, uh, an area of focus as well as um, what can be done for Ukrainian citizens more broadly. Yeah, thanks, Kendra, and thank you uh, for um, having me here today. So uh, to, to piggyback off Andy's uh, comments here, reputations are very hard to earn and easy to lose. Uh, and unfortunately, Ukraine has a poor reputation among the business and investment community. Now, as of February 2022, uh, Ukraine essentially had two private sectors. One private sector that many people are familiar with in, in their own mind's eye related to corruption and oligarchs and that sort of thing. But there was another private sector, and it was just getting its stride ready. 2022 is going to be the biggest growth in GDP, the biggest FDI in Ukraine's history. Now, unfortunately, the Russians had other plans for Ukraine. What will happen in the rebuilding of Ukraine is a re-engagement of this progressive business community that was already there. Those businesses are there. They're making investments. They're fighting for their lives and their businesses. Their assets, assets aren't off in some tax shell somewhere. They're there on the ground, and they're fighting alongside their countrymen and women to, uh, to fight for their lives and fight for their businesses and the investments that they've made over the past generation of a free and independent Ukraine. Now, what type of, uh, of policy should, be, should uh, the business community engage in? Uh, to my mind, the investments in judicial reform and regulatory policy are all needed and valid, but that takes a long time to pay off. So the best policy uh, that we can pursue or we can push forward is a policy of competition, creating more investors, more pressure, and more eyes of investors on what Ukraine is doing and pushing the, the country forward in the private sector in a positive direction to engage more with the EU which already has those sustainability standards, which already is committed to labor rights and, and human dignity. Uh, and that is the kind of community uh, that the business community can be in Ukraine to drive those changes forward. Um, there's a, 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 a long time uh, coming uh, to this point, and it's unfortunate that Ukraine had to suffer this much for people to realize how amazing the country is uh, in terms of human capital, in terms of innovation, Ukraine will be there, and it will go from a laggard to a leader in the EU. Thank you for that, Eric. Um, I want to actually turn back now to the Deputy Administrator, and something that you said in your first question where you said, we don't want to lose this moment. Um, and I, I like that Eric uh, highlighted the, the policy of competition, which is something that you touched on in your first question. Um, would you share with us, uh, from your perspective, what are some of the ways that the private sector uh, can support um, uh, improving the investment climate within Ukraine. I, I don't know if competition policy is part of that, but I, I'm certain you have a few recommendations that we could learn from. But before I jump to that, I just want to pick up on something that Tara said, because, and, and it relates also to other comments on this panel. Um, this, is, this moment has been a long time in the making. It didn't happen overnight. And there has been, over the past decade in particular, a lot of change and investment in increasing transparency, um, institutions, strengthening sectors, um, the work, and, and USAID has, has been a part of it on the electricity. I remember it was the eve of, of Russia's invasion, and I was told, wait, Ukraine's about to disconnect from Russia and go into island mode? What is that? But it worked out. <laughs> but it was a long time coming of all of these investments um, to, to get it to this point. And I think that, well, I can say that with, with certainty that USAID um, and the US government more broadly will continue to invest in that blocking and tackling those very boring but incredibly important investments in 
institutions, in capabilities, in transparency, in policies, um, competition policy, uh, transparency, all of these things. The, what the private sector can do is to recognize the changes that have happened, is to recognize the two different economies that have been noted here. There is a very vibrant economy, and to bring your skills, your expertise, your investment, um, and, and also make, make very clear with the Ukrainian government, which from every interaction I have, they are hugely responsive. Uh, they want to be a, an attractive place for investment. They recognize that it's uh, critical to get their economy back up on its feet. When you've lost 20% of your population to Europe and you know the clock is ticking, the longer these people stay, they've got jobs, their kids are in school, the harder it is to get them back. And they're, they're very focused on that, you know, to, re, to invest in housing, um, the um, energy sector, retail services, all of these things. I'm so glad to hear Uber's back uh, or, or expanding, you know, that it's um, making life uh, what it can and should be and, and mutually benefiting along the way. So um, it's really from me a call to the private sector to ask questions, uh, to bring your um, uh, ideas to the table. If you see something that's not up to the world-class standards that you require for your investment decisions, make it known. Be a problem solver and help the country get to where it can and should be. The track that it was on pre-invasion, pre-further invasion last year, um, it needs to uh, be able to get back on that track and it will only do so in partnership with all of you. So come to the table with your skills, your expertise, your investment and, uh, and, and uh, find the, the way forward together with a government that I know is very much open for business. Thank you. Well, let me turn to you then and ask you the same question. How do you see the business community co-creating uh, the investment climate that, that spurs additional investment? First of all, I think that, that uh, we, with all this list of examples, which I would like to, to extend <laughs> further, because you know that, that if you purchase this Nest, Nestle, uh, Nescafe, that you, you don't need to turn it upside down, because invoice for this machine is made in, in Lviv, because these, there is a factory of accountants that every invoice for, for Nespresso is made in, in Lviv globally in all the world. But I saw that this list is incredibly long, but you mentioned ABCD, the global traders, and usually trade is absolutely ambivalent to any politics. So that whatever sanctions, wars, and so traders usually remain everywhere globally, because it's, this is the features of, of, of this industry, and there are a lot of books on this. But this time, it's different. So we see that, that global traders are actually leaving Russia because, because of Russia is aggressor, because of sanctions, but as well because of the business culture there, because it is really full of vested interest, oligarchs, centralization, everything of what we got read for in last decade, so starting from 2000, at least 2014. And and it, it's otherwise, despite the war, all of them are operating in, in, in Ukraine. And despite all the blockages of seaports, uh, complications on land border, land border, we export and our agriculture works and operate thanks to competition because people don't want to leave Ukrainian market because they lose the market share for, for other competitors. It, it works with farmers as well. But at the same time, it's incredible pressure against government. Because if you have a lot of companies and they say they are like say no to something that was proposed by government, it's really you know that this critical reassessment and dialogue with business, what helps us also to think twice uh, about the quality of regulations we propose. So that's why this dynamic is getting better and better every year. And there is one tiny comment on this because I was part of MCM uh, for several years, working permanently there. And I remember that when I started this, it was like still the habit that companies didn't stay and ask direct questions to, to the government. Didn't say that I am the CEO of a particular trader or particular producer and I have problems with tax authorities. Now in our dialogue, dialogue with uh, business community, it's absolutely different. So companies are feeling safe to say that I am a particular company and I have the problem, I have suggestion, I have policy objective, I'm advocating another, another topic. And this openness in, in dialogue, that dialogue that happens uh, in Ukraine is a really good 
sign that the spirit of competition, open competition, is already embedded in Ukraine, is embedded in the, in the engine of Ukrainian, Ukrainian economy. And last but not least, so that this time, the issue of anti-corruption and um, justice is going beyond business, is going beyond attractiveness of investments. So we have really thousands of people uh, died on the front. And all of them have, <laughs> it's always difficult to talk about this. But um, they will say that why our people died if we still have social injustice. So that's why this time it's absolutely different. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister. We know that you carry yes, a, a... No, no. Um, it, it really speaks to the power of why this moment is so important and what we really need to do to make sure that those lives are not lost in vain and that that, that uh, sacrifice is honored in what we do together in collaboration. Um, let me turn to you, Andy. Uh, I, I just want to add to what Tara says. Two things, I think. Firstly, the dialogue. Uh, we have every fortnight, we have meetings with Taras. Uh, to discuss international trade. We have meetings with pretty much most of the ministers on a very regular basis, so that dialogue is there. But I think Taras's point, it, it just highlights that the sentiment in Ukraine, now is the time, because the cost that Ukraine and Ukrainians are paying is so high. And um, I think uh, Ukrainians will not allow uh, things to go back to the old ways. This is the game changer. And I think you can see the passion uh, on the front lines, but also the passion in the business. So be a part of this change. I invite you. So Eric, I'm going to uh, give you the difficult job of not only responding to that, but uh, offering us any sort of last thoughts that you would leave the audience with, be it a call to action from, from what's been shared on this panel or, or from your work where there can be better opportunities to, to work together to ensure that we are, are doing our part to strengthen uh, the environment and to invite in uh, more partners into this growth story. No pressure, right? No pressure. Sum everything up. <laughs> so what is it to be a Ukrainian business person today in 2023? It's to be engaged in your country. It's to be a leader. It's to be uh, a driver of reform and transparency. And it's to create a new Ukraine one that is inclusive, one that is driving innovation, one that is a leader in Europe. And if you're sitting here in this room today, in this chamber, you're a part of that. So be a part of it, engage, engage more, and engage and drive the future of Ukraine because only, we can only do this together. Deputy Administrator, any closing thoughts, call to action? Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm just gonna echo um, uh, be a part of it. You know, this is, um, I think, important uh, above and beyond Ukraine's economy. It, this is one of the most geostrategic issues facing the world today. It truly is. You know, the, as as has been laid out, um, this is the moment for for really good to triumph over really bad and be a part of it. Thank you, Andy. I fully agree. I think uh, we are seeing uh, this battle uh, is an existential battle. Uh, the uh, the uh, courage of, of Ukrainian, Ukrainian women and men on the front lines is truly inspirational. I think Ukraine is inspiring the world. Uh, and now I think it's, it's, it's for, for us and the business community to really come together and support and, and build a new country. This is really the biggest uh, recovery, uh, re reconstruction of a nation in Europe since World War II. And uh, let, let's do this together. I, I will change the, the, the path of um, and the motion of, of uh, the final statements. Uh, but I would like to come back to the uh, 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 Deputy Minister Coleman uh, mentioned about the Advantage Ukraine, so the platform that is supported by USAID and the general cooperation between USAID, DFC and Ministry of Economy. So, so after all these statements, I think that the, I hope that the interest to go and to invest in Ukraine from, from the stretch Will, will be bigger and stronger. So that's why if you have any additional information, so we have this 
platform advantage Ukraine to, to take this competitive advantage here and now and we are open for you and we cooperate as well with MCM on this particular project and generally so that's why if you have any additional inquiries so then we are all open and we are really uh, want to help you also to overcome these perceptions and to take the moment of, of this to, to take this momentum yeah and thank you well ladies and gentlemen I think you've heard that um, this is the moment um, and we are inviting you all in as you heard to ask the questions uh, to be uh, uh, present um, and to be willing to engage in the conversation that there is a dialogue that is emerging, that the long-term work um, that has been done up to this point um, is making uh, a pathway for you all. Obviously, there's been a number of uh, discussions here. There's no uh, sugarcoating that it is uh, a challenging way forward, but that, that the way forward is through partnership. And, and again, a special thank you to the Deputy Minister for reminding us that as we talk about policies, we talk about reforms and governance, at the heart of this is really um, a human story, uh, a story of how we can uh, work together to support uh, the people of Ukraine uh, during this uh, special moment so that it's not lost. So please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists. <laughs>